Afternoon. Art Hostage here and we're going to do another episode. Now this is episode 116. And I want to tell you the story, right, about a, a gangster, South London criminal called George Francis. Okay, I used to know him as Georgie. Georgie Francis, okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you Okay, the story, he got murdered in, um, I think it was the 16th of May, 2003, right? And I, what I'll do is I'll read you the articles that are in the, in the news, okay? And then at the end, I'll go back and then I'll tell you, right, how I got to know Georgie Francis in the 1980s and my dealings with Georgie Francis, right? He, um, at the time I knew him, he had a pub in Edenbridge called the Henry VIII. Um, and he had so much money, right? He had the best carpets in there with miniature Henry the Apes, right, embroidered on the carpet. And even in his Range Rover and his Rolls Royce, all the carpets had a little Henry the Apes all over them. Anyway, I'll get back to that in a minute, right? We'll start with this, right? The first one, it's in The, the Observer by Tony Thompson on Sunday, the 18th of May, 2003. Right, well, Georgie Francis got killed on the 14th of uh, May 2003, right? So here we go. Curse of the Br Brinks Mat Millions, and that's a reference to the Brinks Mat robbery at Heathrow in 1983 when £26 million worth of gold was stolen. You know, Mickey McAvoy and all that stuff. Right, anyway, so here we go. The murder of George Francis in Bermondsey last week was just the latest in a long line of killings that have all been linked to Brit Britain's biggest armed robbery and the ten £10 million pound that is still unaccounted for. When 63-year-old George Francis was gunned down in a South London street in the early hours of Wednesday morning, it sent a wave of panic and terror throughout the underworld. At first, it seemed the death of the former associate of the Cray Twins whose name had been linked to at least 20 murders, was just part of London's increasingly violent gang wars. An observer investigation can reveal, however, that Francis is the latest victim of what has been dubbed the curse of the Brinks Mat Millions. Francis's murder is the ninth in a 20-year saga of betrayal, double dealing and death in the hunt for the proceeds of Britain's biggest ever robbery when a gang raided a Brinks Mac warehouse at Heathrow and got away with £26 million in gold ingots. And at least £10 million is still unaccounted for and few believe this killing will be the last. 17 months ago, Brian Perry, also 63, and also linked to the Brinks Mac raid, was shot dead in almost identical circumstances as he arrived for a work um, for work a few hundred yards from where Francis was killed. In December 1998, Hatton Garden jeweller Soli Nahum, who had helped melt down hundreds of gold bars on behalf of the notorious Adams family, was shot dead outside his home. John Fordham, a policeman, was stabbed to death by Kenneth Noy while carrying out undercover surveillance in the grounds of Noy's home. Noy was cleared of murder, but was sentenced in 1986 to 14 years for his part in helping to dispose of the gold. Noy is now serving life for the road rage murder of Stephen Cameron in 1999, while his business partner, John Goldfinger Palmer, has been in prison for a timeshare fraud. And you've got to remember, this is, back, this is in 2003, okay, they were talking about now. Others who handled the gold but managed to escape prosecution have also ended up behind bars. In 1995, Tony White, acquitted in the original Brinks Mac trial, was found to have handled the gold and was ordered to pay back almost £28 million. Two years later, he was jailed for his part in a £65 million smuggling ring. The shooting of George Francis last Wednesday morning outside the office of his Bermondsey courier business is the latest murder linked to the Brinks Mat raid. Francis arrived early for work, as he always did, to meet the first trucks arriving from the continent. 
His killer is believed to have lain in wait for Francis Green Rover 75 to come into view. As Francis stepped out of the car, the hitman fired at least four shots into his head and chest at point-blank range. Although Underworld sources are convinced that the brinks mac connection is the key, Francis was questioned over allegations that he helped launder the money. No one is sure of the exact motive for the killing. One prominent South London face who declined to be named told the observer, did he know where the gold is or is it just war a warning telling those who do that they better speak up? This has made a lot of people in South London very, very jumpy. It was just after 6 40 a.m. on the 26th of November 1983 that six armed men burst into the Heathrow depot of the security company Brinks Mac. The robbers dis disabled the sophisticated security system, tied up the guards and doused them with petrol, gasoline. The, the guards were threatened with being set alight unless they revealed the combinations to the locks. Once in the vault, the robbers removed 6,800 ingots of gold. So you've got to remember, right, these are not like the big gold bars you see in the Bank of England. Okay, these were um, these were very, quite small, small and portable. So, you know, you stretch your hand out. Right, so that's why there were so many of them, right? So, you know, you, you know when they say 6,800 ingots, not gold bars and great big things, right? Anyway. The gang changed the face of, of all the gang changed the face of organized crime overnight. The underworld had been a strictly cash business until then. No one within the robbers' immediate circle had any experience of dealing with gold. The gang had been expected to find only cash. So the call for help was put out far and wide. George Francis soon came into the picture. On the fringes of the underworld, with a string of convictions for theft and violence, Francis rose to, rose to prominence in late 1979 when he became part of a group of armed robbers who decided to move into drug trafficking. Specially converted containers were sent to a shoe factory in Pakistan where millions of pounds of cannabis were hidden by legitimate goods and shipped back to the UK. The first four runs went like clockwork, lovely. Right, and that's when he bought the Henry VIII pub in Edenbridge. Francis and other members of the gang began living the good life, buying cars, jewellery and make, making a show of lighting their cigars with £20 notes in South London pubs. But when the fifth drug consignment arrived, customs officers were watching. Lenny Teddy Bear Watkins drove a lorry filled with £2.5 million of cannabis, spotted the surveillance team, prompting customs investigators investigator Peter Bennett to move in and make an arrest. Watkins shot Bennett dead. Now that, right, was the incident I've spoken about in earlier podcasts. You remember when I said, right, that in 1980, the whole world, all the armed robbers, right, when they got, who used to go robbing um, banks and robbing the wages out of um, vans delivering wages because everything was in cash them days with a pump action on the pavement, Okay, right, they were getting 15, 20 years, right, and then they kept getting faster and faster uh, getaway cars, but then the police brought in the helicopter, and so that was the armed robbery over and done with. Because <coughs> you can't outrun helicopter. So then they started looking around, this is like 70s, right, they started looking around and then realised that you could get a bag of white powder, like a bag of sugar, which was cocaine, and you could earn like five, ten thousand pounds. Now that might be your share of just a bit of work on the pavement. And so they so they moved into the drug game. And that's what Georgie Francis was one of the first. And his gang. And so they started with the cannabis. Okay, which had up until then really was something that hippies did, and they drive over the continent and fill up the back of a mini or something like that with, you know, blocks of um cannabis and then just come back through customs right it was on a very small scale so anyway right i've spoken about this before and then in 1980 79 right late 79 was when peter bennett got killed he was the um customs officer and that changed the whole world every other gangster and armed robber right started getting in the drug game and then all of a sudden the police went well we got a you know a future pandemic with um drugs on their hand it all changed so anyway, let's get back to this, right? 
Lenny Teddy Bear Watkins driving a lorry filled with two and a half million pounds worth of cannabis spotted the surveillance team, prompting customs investigator Peter Bennett to move in and make the arrest. Watkins shot Bennett dead. Watkins was sent sentenced to life and the rest of the gang were put on trial. Underworld sources say that Francis offered to pay more than £100,000 to get the jury at his, in his trial nobbled. Right, he tried to um, get the jury um, corrupted and offered £100,000. You've got to remember, this is 1980, so that's a million pound now. The contract was taken up by the North London Adams family and it turned out to be money well spent. The first jury failed to reach a verdict. This result resulted in a retrial that led to his acquittal. While Francis walked free, several other members of the gang faced with same evidence have pleaded guilty. See, George weren't having none of it, right? You know what I mean? He went, listen, I'll go down swinging. Right? The others thought, oh no, this don't look good. And it was back in the days where you didn't get credit really for, for pleading guilty. Now you can get... um. 50% off of what they would, you know, if the sentence for an offence is, say, um, three years, right, you'll get 50% of that off for pleading guilty or a third off. Then it weren't that. But anyway, George weren't having none of it, right? He's He pleaded not guilty, the first one. They all pleaded guilty, right? They couldn't re reach a verdict. Retrial, not guilty. So anyway, right, while Francis walked free, several other members of the gang faced with the same evidence of pleaded guilty. Soon afterwards, Francis became involved with the Brinks Mac gang. Francis is believed to have laundered hundreds of thousands of pounds in the space of a few months. Tracking down those at the heart of the raid presented few problems for detectives. The fact that the robbers knew their way around the security system pointed to an inside job. When detectives discovered that one of the guards, Anthony Black, had arrived late for work, missing the robbery. Missing the robbery, they questioned him. He soon named one Mickey. He named one Mickey McAvoy. Actually, Anthony Black, right, was um, um, his wife or his girlfriend, right? Her brother was um, Robinson, Brian Robinson, who was um, on the on the raid with Mac Mickey McAvoy. McAvoy had done little to disguise his newfound wealth. Within weeks of the robbery, he had left his council house and moved into a mansion. He also bought two Rockweilers and named them Brinks and Matt. You see, now we're talking back then, right, 1983. Now, if you're going to read your history books, you know what I mean, like someone like Daniel Kinnahan, you see how Mickey McAvoy um, acted there, bang, straight on top, and leaving, you know, doing stupid things, calling it Brinks and Matt. You know what I mean? I know it's funny and you can have a joke, but not when you're up to serious stuff like that. It's taking the piss. This was not the only mistake. Sentenced to 25 years, McAvoy believed his friends and associates would look after his share of the gold while he was away. One such friend, known only as the Fox, has been one of the most senior figures in organised crime for years. The Fox claimed to have passed on the money to, uh, to the likes of McAvoy's friend, Brian Perry, and Francis, Georgie Francis, though many suspected that he had kept it for himself. In 1985, unable to pay the remainder of the fee for having the jewellery nobbled, Francis was shot in the shoulder close to the pub he ran in the Kent village of Hever. Well, no, actually, right, It's um, it was the Henry VIII pub in Edenbridge, right, and what happened was someone came in the bar, right, and they shot, um, George was, George Francis was behind the bar. Okay, and they shot him, and it went in the shoulder, and then the gun jammed, and then he had to run out, the um, gunman run out at a pub. So they got that wrong. Right, and I know that, because I was told, from Georgie Francis told me the story. Anyway, right, he settled his account with interest after becoming involved in a series of crimes to pay off his debt. In August, not <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> In August 1990, he was found guilty of being involved in smuggling £1 million worth of cocaine on a private yacht. He was sentenced to 16 years. Released three years ago, which meant like in nine, uh, 2000, he started his courier firm and moved into a mansion in Bromley. There is little evidence that he was actively involved in crime at the time of his death. What many in the criminal fraternity find particularly disturbing is that, like Perry before him, 
Francis gave no indication that he believed his life was at risk. When McAvoy was released in 2000, he was told by the Fox that his money had vanished and that the likes of Perry and Francis were to blame. Although Francis convinced Mickey McAvoy that this was not the case. Although there is no suggestion of any involvement, five of the murders linked to Brink's Matt have taken place since McAvoy's release and police are expected to question him over the latest killings. Well, he went to Spain anyway, right? In the meantime, the hunt for the remaining £10 million of missing gold, both by the police and criminal fraternity, continues. So that came out in 2003, right? And when I saw it, I thought, oh dear, poor old Georgie um, Francis. Now, I didn't think it was anything to do with the um, Brinks Mac thing, right? Because um, 2000, Mickey McAvoy got out, he went to Spain, right? And, indeed, and there was some money left, right? It weren't all gone, right? And there was some gold and, and all this sort of carry on, right? And then he got involved in the laundering and drugs and all that carry on, right? And so you can get lumps of money back, right? So Mickey McAvoy got millions anyway. Right, but well then we're going to fast forward to um, Thursday, 2nd of August, 2007. The BBC, pair guilty of gangster's murder. Two men have been convicted of murdering a career criminal who was linked to the £26 million Brinks Matt Heist. George Francis, 63, from Beckenham, Kent, was shot four times at his haulage firm in Bermondsey, South London, by contract killers in 2003. He was killed after he tried to collect a £70,000 debt from a business contact, the old Bailey heard. Terence Conaghan, 54, from Glasgow, and John, John O'Flynn, 53, from Chesh Hunt, Hertfordshire, were found guilty of murder. The business contact, Harry Richardson of Petswood, Orpington, South East London, who was accused of ordering the killing, was cleared by the jury. During the trial, the victim's wife, Irene, said he was no angel, while Victor Temple QC, prosecuting, said Mr Francis had a chequered history and was a career criminal. Mr Francis is believed to have helped dispose of a large part of the Brinksmack gold, uh, gold bullion heist in 1983. He was the ninth man linked to the robbery to be killed. Mr Francis was shot in the face, back, arm and finger as he went to collect a newspaper from his car. His body was found slumped in the front seat with his legs hanging out of the passenger door. After the shooting, it was found that a CCTV camera at a yard had been adjusted so that it did not film Mr Francis' death, the court heard during the trial. Mr Francis has survived a previous attempt on his life when he was shot at a pub he owned in Kent 18 years ago. For the prosecution, Mr Temple said a cigarette end and a pair of glasses found near the scene showed traces of O'Flynn and Conaghan's DNA. Fuck me, that's a basic mistake, isn't it? They dropped a snout and a pair of glasses. Or you could, like in the old days, say that they were planted there, but anyway, you know what I mean? You know, but anyway, a 9mm Luger bullet, the same type used to kill Mr Francis, was also found near the building. After his arrest, Mr Richardson had denied any involvement in the murder and owing Mr Francis money. He said they had been friends. Describing the murder as a clinical execution, Detective Superintendent Stuart Cundy said it was a callous act on George who believed he was attending a meeting but in fact had been lured to his death. I thank those witnesses who came forward and gave evidence despite threats and fears for their own personal safety. O'Flynn and Conaghan will be sentenced on Friday. And then we've got the sentencing coming up here, right? And this comes from, what's it from? London News. Okay, Terence Conaghan, 54, from Glasgow, and John O'Flynn, 53, from Cheshunt, were convicted of murder on Thursday and have been ordered to serve at least 20 years. Well, they get the mandatory life sentence, right, which is in the UK, any murder charge, right, it's ma a mandatory life sentence and then you get a recommendation, right, so that was when was this, 2007, well they're due out in 2027, right, it's the earliest, so we're talking five years. Harry Richardson was found not guilty. Mr Francis was shot four times at his haulage firm in Bermondsey on the 14th of May 2003. 
The jury heard that Conlon and O'Flynn were paid £3,000 to murder Mr. Francis. How about that? They got £1,500 each to murder Georgie Francis. Unbelievable. Over a £70,000 debt. So it's nothing to do with the Brinks Matt thing, right? Although I'll have a chat to you about that in a minute. Okay. Right, it's now speaking. I don't really want to talk about that when, it, when it, all the bullets went in. You know, he got out of the car, returned to, his, to collect a newspaper, shot four times. The bullets entered the right side of his face, the right side of his back, his left arm, his right ring finger. Gordon Bennett. Right. Anyway, right, more importantly, I'll pay tribute to George, George's family, especially his wife, that's Irene. Right, for the patient's faith and belief in the police over the last four years. I hope today's conviction goes some way to pay tribute to their memories of George. I still believe others are involved and bear some responsibility for contracting George's murder. I appeal to anyone with information leading to the arrest and conviction to contact the police on all crime stoppers. Yeah, well, whatever with all that. So that's the story of George Francis, right? Georgie Francis, okay? So now, right, my connection, right, is in 1986, right, I go to London, um, and we go up to, sorry, we go up to Kent, right, me and Steve and Paul, right, you know, the um, heroin addict scumbag, Steve and Paul, yeah, he runs the bar in Brighton, Delamar, heroin dealer, right, to this day, police informer as well, anyway, registered. So anyway, 1986, we go up and meet Gerald Copeland and his brother David Copeland, and we go to their dad's house, which is a place in called Pratt's Bottom, right? Pratt's Bottom. I know it's a funny name, isn't it? So we go down to Pratt's Bottom, right, where his dad lives. And at the bottom of the, he's got land there. And at the bottom there, he's got a big shed where they burn off the um, rubber hoses to get to the copper in the middle. It's totally illegal, it was. But his father was earning a £1,000 a week at it. And there was clouds of black smoke and that all going up in the air, right? I mean, God, dear, I mean, it was toxic then, right? You'd be undrawn and quartered now if you try to do it well anyway so we meet them right and anyway we go off down to Eden Bridge right to see Georgie Francis and we go to the Henry VIII pub now at this time right and um, what had happened right there'd been some shenanigans and fighting and there'd been the geezer come in the bar to shoot George gun jammed and all that game and then he's shot in the shoulder and all that where well, the police had revoked the license of the Henry VIII pub so they weren't allowed to open for business, right? So, um, but funny enough, it then just turned into a lot of den of iniquity because people would just go up there, you know, all the underworld and that, and then they, it was like their own private little pub and didn't have to worry about members of the public coming in or undercover old Bill or anything. <coughs> and George was always doing sweeps for bugs, but he got it all done up lovely upstairs and there was about three or four bedroom suites because he was going to, when he was running it as a pub, right, he wanted, you know, people could stay overnight, bed and breakfast and dinner and all that. Beautiful it was. I mean, I'm top of the range. Wooden doors and all that. Anyway, so I get introduced to him and we're talking and everything, right? And he says, what do you do? I said, well, I'm on the knocker, you know, antiques and, uh, you know, a bit of dodgy gear and all that. He went, well, he said, I can get hold of some. Um, he said, sometimes. He said, come up and see me. I went, all right, well. And then, and then we was upstairs and he had one of the bedrooms that he'd just done out. He said he was looking for an antique washstand, right, like a little dressing table, right? So I went, oh, I said, I might be able to find you one, right? So I thought, well, if I get that, right, I'm not worried about earning a profit, right? It gives me an excuse to go up and see Georgie Francis on my own and have a chat to him, see if he can get hold of any yucky gear, you know what I mean? Any stolen antiques that I might be able to earn a few bob out of. So anyway, we come back to Brighton, right? Anyway, I go and find myself a little washstand, right? Nice little William the Fourth one. Weren't, weren't a lot of money. I think it cost me about £200, two and a quarter, something like that. Drove it up to um, Georgie Francis. He was knocked out of it. He went lovely, innit? He? he said, how much is that? £500? I went, no, George, you can have it trade. I said, it's cost me £200 or 225 I said, give me give me a pony on top of it, two and a half. He went, you're a gentleman, right? So he gave me 250 so I've earned 25 quid. Take the petrol off, I ain't earned a lot of money. He said, do you want to stay? So I'm there, right? And anyway, during the day, right, there's all these faces coming in and they're having a drink and a chat and all that. And he went, yeah, he's all right, young Paul Def, um, from Brighton, antique dealer and all that. And so I'm just saying, yeah, listen, anytime you get any gear, you know what I mean, um, sell it to George and I'll buy it. So anyway, I stayed over, 
right, in one of these rooms, right, and I think, it, I don't know if it was the room that I'd give, he'd put the um, uh, wash stand in, anyway, so I'm staying over, right, and then there's, I look down by the door, and there's like the thing, right, holding the door open, right, like a big lump of lead, you know, like a door stop, that's it, a door stop, and I'd noticed, right, there were two or three of them at the door, and I thought, oh, well, it's when you hold the door open, and you just sort of put this door stop, and I kept looking at this thing, right, and obviously my little brain, you know what my little brain's like, right, you know, I'm associating and I'm remembering because of George and the Brinks Matt thing and all this carry on, now this is 1986, right, so I go over and I'm looking at this, um, and I've had a few, I'm looking at this door stop, so anyway, I go over to it, right, and I'm thinking, oh, it's fucking heavy, it was really heavy, but like very dense, anyway, so I scratched it, right, and you won't believe it, and it, all, and it looked gold underneath, and I thought, nah, this is bollocks, right, I thought, George's connection with Brinks, Matt, surely he ain't got some of the gold he's had melted down and, and melted and moulded into like doorstops, I thought, nah, I said, it can't be, but anyway, so I'll get up in the morning, right, Go down for a bit of breakfast, sitting there with George, and go, here, George. Right? I said, um, listen, I noticed you got them door st stops. I said, they think they're quite nice. I said, I'm looking for something like that. I said, then chance I can buy them off you. And he looked at me and he smiled. He said, why do you want to buy them? I said, um, well, I said, listen, I'll tell you the truth. I said, George, last night I'm looking at it, right? I scratched it, it's a bit of gold. It's gold underneath. I said, let me tell you, right, I'm going to take the chance here. Right, I think you have had some of that Brinks Mac gold made into these doorstops, right, in case you get in trouble and you can just grab them, right, and, you know, and run away or something. It's like your, your getaway money. He went, fuck me. He went, how the fuck do you know that? He said, you know what? I've had this place spun by the old build, right? He said, must be half a dozen times, right? He said, they just step over them. He said, never done anything. I went, no. He went, yeah. I went, well, listen, George, can't you cash them up? You know what I mean? You know, you know, put a few quid my way. And he laughed, right? <clears throat> he laughed, right? And he said, listen, he said, now, because you know, he said, I've got to move them. He said, I can't have them here anymore. He said, I know you won't say anything, keep your mouth shut. He said, but you know, I can't take the chance. He said, but I'll tell you what I'll do with you. He said, I'll give you a couple of grand, right? He said, Be because your detective work was so good. So I went, oh, thank you very much, George. Laugh, right? So anyway, I came out of there, right, right, with the £2,000, right, to keep my mouth shut. Now, he was going to move them, like, within an hour after I'd gone, obviously, because it's come on top. I've discovered, right, he's got these door stops. So anyway, I go off, right, and then a few weeks later, I go back and see him. I go, anything coming then, George? He went, yeah. He said, there's a few bits and pieces, right, um, that the... Um, the shoplifters had stolen from antique shops in London. So I've bought a few bits off him and he let me have them cheap. And then I went off to Brighton, sold them. And I think I went back there once more. I'm, oh, and yes, by the way, I noticed the door stops weren't there anymore. Right? You know what I mean? So I went back and I had a couple of deals and then that was it, right? I'm, um, by the end of 86, right, that was it. You know, I never saw George Georgie Francis ever again and... I moved on, I was just buying and selling, and that was it. But that was my little um, intro into the Brinks Matt thing, right, where it was nothing really that was confirmed, right, but Georgie Francis was involved in um, the Brinks Matt and handling the gold. And you've got to remember as well, right, the Brinks Matt gold, as I said earlier, weren't in great big gold bars, right, they were um, tiny little bars. Not tiny, tiny, but like, um, I don't know, like, um, uh... Well, how big? Sort of like the size of your hand. Okay, but really dense. Now, obviously, right, he'd had these melted, they'd had them smelted down and, and they'd made them into these things that looked like door stops. Right, and it was funny because I was a bit pissed. I went over to scrape one and it came up gold and I thought, fucking hell. And I know what you're thinking. Yeah, I, could, I should have gone round and, and got all four or five of them and then just run off. Well, it didn't work like that. I mean, I ain't like that. I got up in the morning and told him. And he laughed. He gave me two grand, right, for keeping my mouth shut, right, and for, uh, for my detective work, and laughed, and we had a couple of deals after that, and I never told anyone about that story. I mean, I don't know what he did with them. Probably melted them down and sold them or whatever, because you've got to remember, the Brinks Matt gold, right, was all over the place, because there were only little tiny ingots, 
right? And there's another story about the Brinks, Brinks map, not associated with Georgie Francis. It's a Brighton story. Now, Mickey Underwood, right, the Brighton antique dealer, Mickey Underwood, the knocker boy, right, who was staunch all his life, would never, ever crack a note, right? Um, he used to go up to Garrett Lane and play cards, right, with um, Jim Malone and um, Tommy Ogg. Okay, right, and then uh, uh, there was a bit of gold floating around, right, that had come from the Brinks Mac thing. So Mickey Underwood got hold of some of it, and he went down to Brighton, and he spoke to Bubbles. Now, Bubbles told me this story, 1990, I think this was, or was it 91, or even 92 it might have been. And then what happened, I think it was 92, um, what happened was that Mickey Underwood got hold of some of the gold, and then Bubbles arranged the sale of the gold, okay, and Bubbles got £50,000 out of it, and he bought himself a brand new BMW convertible 3 Series, a red one, for Beverly's wife, okay, and he had a few, Bob, and then Mickey um, Underwood got £100,000, and he bought himself a brand new Mercedes estate with the private plate of H1MDU. So in other words, it said, hi, MDU was Michael David Underwood, right, and he had a few quid. So that's another little story about the Brinks Mac Gold. Another story, right, was that a certain person was uh, um, was offered some in the in the eighties, and they went to see Michael Bloomstein, the um, scrap gold dealer in Brighton. And Michael Bloomstein shit himself so much he went, "Please," he said, "never ever mention this again." He said, "If you do, I'm going to the police." Right? Well, at least he was being honest, wasn't he? That Michael Bloomstein was so terrified he didn't want to get involved in anything with illegal gold. And he said, if you ask me again, I'm going to go to the police and report you. Well, you can say grassing and all that, Karen, or you can say, actually, um, Michael Bloomstein was being honest and saying, look, I want nothing to do with it. Don't ever ask me again. If you do, I should go to the police. So there's just a couple of stories for you. Yeah, I mean, old Georgie Francis, eh? So it shows you how, um, how all the things can get mixed up. You know, and it can all... Um, you know, people can think that it's involved with this and involved with that. Well, with the way it looks like that Georgie Francis was killed by two um, hitmen hired by a drug dealer who owed him £70,000 and he paid £1,500 each to the, the two people who killed him. Oh, and I think there's an update. I forgot to put it up, didn't I? What was his name? The um, One of them, O'Flynn. Yeah, apparently he died when he was in jail in 2014. So he's brown bread, he's gone, so there's only the other one, Conglin or whatever it is, and he's due to get out in 2027, and the bloke, is it Harry Richardson or something like that, apparently, right, he was found not guilty, so you can't say whether he did order it, order the hit or not, and as I say, right, um, so that was my connection, right, well, and the Kenny Noy thing, right, well, I don't know, I've never met the man, right, you know what I mean, I don't, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know him from Adam, and him, John Palmer, right, I don't know him, I've never met him. Although, um, I knew his brother in Birmingham, um, Palmer's brother, who used to get involved in the jewellery. Was it Malcolm? Was it Malcolm? Malcolm Palmer? Or was he the roofer? One of them was a roofer and one was involved in the jewellery game, in the jewellery quarter in Birmingham. Danny Newman knew him. That was John Palmer's brother. And next week, right, next Tuesday... Right, and we're gonna, I'm going to co-host with um, Fighting Talk UK, right, YouTube. We're going to do one of them live stream. He's sorting it out because you know me. I don't understand how to do anything like that. But we're going to do a live stream from 9 o'clock next Tuesday evening, right, on Fighting Talk UK, right, and we're going to talk about um, Kenny Noy and John Palmer and, you know, what's happened and what, you know, the discussions were about um, the killing of John Palmer and the possible reasons behind it. And is he really dead? Um, and Kenny Noy, you know, who was convicted of uh, handling the um, Brinks match stu um, gold and got 14 years, and then he came out and then he was convicted of murdering that Cameron um, fella on the um, slip road and got life, and then he's just been released this year, a couple of months ago or a few months ago, he's now released on strict licence, obviously, for the rest of his life. 
you know, and one would assume or one would hope that he keeps his head down and would have nothing to do with it. I mean, personally, I hope he's got enough money for his retirement and never has to get involved in anything criminal ever again. So we're going to be looking at that, right? So look out for that, okay? That's Fighting Talk UK YouTube channel, right? We're doing a live stream, right? Tuesday, the 31st of May from 9 p.m. UK time. So that'll be, what, 4 p.m.? Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. Central Time, right, 10 p.m. Um, in Europe Time. So look out for that. But yeah, just a little story. And now, you know, I sort of dip in and out. I mean, that's always been my MO, right? In and out, right? You know, in, have a few deals, out, walk away, and that's it, right? And then and then that's the way it should always be. You stay around too long, right? And it gets, um, it can get heavy and all that carry on. Right, in ben, Benjamin Franklin, right, he used to have a saying, right, he said, friends or guests, he said, guests are like fish, they start to smell after three days, <clears throat> and what that means is when you have people come to visit you, right, the first day's lovely, second day's nice, but by the third day, really, you want to get back to normal, don't you, really, and you don't want them there, and if you are a guest, you go there, first day you enjoy it, second, then by the third day you want to go. And it's the same. That's the way I've always tried to apply it in business. I'm going to sneeze. Hang on. Hang on. No. It's, <coughs> excuse me. Right. So that's a sneeze. Yeah. So that's why I've got all these loads of stories. I mean, I knew everyone and everyone knew me. But I was in and out. You know what I mean? In, have a deal out and then just move on. So I hope you like that one, right? That's Art Hostage, episode 116. The story of Georgie Francis, the rise and fall of Georgie Francis, RIP, may God rest his soul, Art Hostage signing off.